person. <laughs>
Thank you, Pastor. Just so thrilled to be here tonight. Would you open your Bibles with me tonight? The New Testament Scriptures. I want to call your attention to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 16. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 16. While you're finding your place in this marvelous portion of God's Word, let me take just a moment to say how thrilled I am to be here. I do not feel worthy. I am just not worthy to be here. And I know that this week has been a great week for you. Uh, you know, you've been hearing some of the cream of the crop this week. Great preachers, great men of God. And this is, a, this is a wonderful meeting that you have here, Wolf Creek. And I bless the Lord for it. And I pray it'll go on for many, many years to come. I was thinking about a moment ago, listening to the choir singing, listening to the special. And the music has just been exceptional tonight. Thank you so very much. I was thinking about the heritage that this great church has. And I was thinking about, look out, see Brother Claude Nicholson there, one of my heroes. I love him in the Lord and I bless the Lord for his friendship, led you down through the years. I think about Brother Don Riddle, already home to be with the Lord and we're so looking forward to seeing him again by the good grace of God and uh, we loved him and appreciated him so much. And now under the capable leadership of Brother Alan Johnson, my personal friend, a great preacher of the Word of God and I'm so glad to know him in the journey of life. He preached for us a while back at Midway and I thought they were going to tell me just not to come back after he preached and uh, he brought the house down. I'll tell you, did a great job and I'm just so glad to call him my brother in Christ. You've got a great heritage, Wolf Creek. God bless you. Miss Debbie, thank you for standing by your husband uh, as you, Miss Shirley, the same thing. And Miss Geraldine, God bless you for your faithfulness as well. And it's just so good to be here. And uh, just appreciate the good music. Somebody help me tonight. Good music tonight. Amen? Amen. It's just been wonderful. And I thank the Lord for it. And again, preacher, thank you for letting me come and be with you in this wonderful meeting. Luke chapter 16. I want you to stand with me, if you would, please, in honor for and respect for the reading of the Word of God. Luke chapter 16, I begin reading in verse number 9. I want to read down through verse 26. Follow along with me as we read. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember... That thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 26, a biblical hell. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for what our hearts have already been blessed with tonight. The good fellowship, the good singing tonight. Lord, we're so glad to be together. And Lord, on this Friday evening, Father, this great conference, this great meeting that's been going on in the course of this week, the good Word of God that's been preached, the good singing that this church has been blessed with. And now, Father, tonight as we open Your Word with Your people tonight, Lord, we pray for leadership and guidance, that of Your Holy Spirit. Father, I, I pray for unction tonight. I, I pray, Father, that You'd be pleased to help me, Lord, tonight to speak only that that You'd be pleased with, knowing, Father, that I'm going to stand before the Lord Jesus at the Bema Seat of Christ, and I'm going to give an account of this message tonight. And, oh God, I pray that You'll help me to preach tonight the way I will certainly wish I had have preached when I stand before the Son of Man. Help me, I pray. Lord, prepare our hearts tonight. Speak to us, we pray. Sweet Spirit of God, give us liberty tonight to preach and to hear. And Lord, we'll magnify and bless your name for all you do. For we ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name, giving you the praise. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm not real happy to preach about what I'm preaching tonight. But what I'm preaching is the Word of God. I believe this is the assignment God has given to me. 
The doctrine of a literal burning hell has all but disappeared from the vocabulary of modern religion. Oh, it may not be in some pulpits, in some fashionable churches, in some so-called Bible colleges and seminaries, but we can be sure that a literal burning hell is still in this blessed book of God, the Christian Bible. It's difficult for me to try to describe this awful place the Bible calls hell. No madman in his wildest flight of insanity ever beheld its horror. No nightmare racing across a fevered mind ever pictured a place so utterly dreadful as the place the Bible calls hell. Let the most gifted writer exhaust his literary skill in an attempt to describe the deep, dark, unending caverns of roaring flame and brimstone, and he would not brush the nearest edge of the place the Bible calls hell. The speaker before us tonight is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. As He alone draws back the thin veil separating time from eternity, He allows us to look through the eyes of this text down into the bowels of this earth planet, into that forsaken, dark, forlorn region where the spirits of the unsaved dead are, and we hear them crying, we hear them screaming, we hear them begging tonight as the stench of the brimstone and the sulfuric residue simply is unmistakable. I say to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I hasten to say that Luke 16 is not a parable. I say to you tonight, it is not a parable. In the parable chapter of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 13, I read in Matthew 13, 3, And he, that is the Lord Jesus, spake many things unto them in parables. In verse number 24 of that same 13th chapter, the Bible says, And he spake many things unto them in parables. Verse 31, Another parable spake he unto them. Verse 34, Another parable put he forth unto them. But when we come to Luke 16 verse 19 we read, There was a certain rich man. No indication whatsoever that Luke 16 is a parable. Proper names are never used in the parables of our Lord. No, ladies and gentlemen, what we have before us tonight is an actual historic narrative that literally took place concerning two men who actually lived and died in the days of our Lord's first advent to this earth. Now, let me say tonight that this great passage of Scripture may be easily divided into two sections, two movements, if you please. First of all, in verses 19 through 21, we're introduced to two men before the grave, their earthly existence. And then in verses 22 through 26, we see those same two men beyond the grave their eternal existence. With that brief outline before us, that introduction before us tonight, move with me quickly to verses 19 through 21. Notice two men before the grave. Notice their earthly existence. In verse 19, we're introduced to a man in material wealth as it indicated and evidenced by his dress, the clothing he wore, and his diet, the food he ate. Notice the rich man's clothing. The Bible says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. Our Lord has a definite individual in mind. There was a certain rich man, literally a certain one. Now, his proper name is not disclosed to us, prompting some expositors and teachers to give him the name Dives, the Latin name for rich man. Now, notice here how this man, this rich man, notice how he was clothed in purple and fine linen. Do you notice that verb, was clothed? Now, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck tonight, but I want to help you tonight, something that helped me. You that have studied the English language, you're aware, I'm sure, that the middle voice of any verb is used as an intensifier. When the Bible says he was clothed, the wording would suggest here that he himself just kept on wrapping himself up habitually in purple and fine linen. We're seeing a man, ladies and gentlemen, who was absolutely obsessed with 
himself. He just kept on wrapping himself up in purple and fine linen. Purple garments have an interesting origin in the Orient. The land of Israel is bordered on the west by the Mediterranean Sea. In the briny waters of the Mediterranean, there lives a tiny shellfish which was much sought after by commercial fishermen for one tiny drop of luxurious crimson dye found in its body. When enough of those shellfish were harvested and the dye extracted, the dye was placed in a vat or a deep pan. A linen garment was then dipped or baptized in that crimson dye. That purple garment was then sold for fabulous sums of money on the oriental market. Hence, only royalty or the extremely wealthy wore purple. But this rich man just kept on wrapping himself up in purple. Look at something else here. We're told he wrapped himself up, he was clothed in fine linen, extremely expensive, made from flax that was gathered from the banks of the Nile River. That linen in some quarters in that day and even in some places today I'm told, Egyptian linen is considered some of the finest linen in the world. We're introduced to a man in material wealth as evidenced by the dress or the clothing that he wore. But not only his dress, do you notice his diet here? Look at it. We're told he fared sumptuously every day. Now those two words, fared sumptuously, suggest banqueting and feasting. I'm persuaded that the top-rated, finest oriental chefs of that day stood ready to prepare whatever culinary dish the rich man desired, not monthly, not even weekly, but every day. We have a man in material wealth as evidenced by his dress, the clothing he wore, and his diet, the food he ate. But move further with me here and look at verses 20 through 21. Notice how we find a man in material want. Now, let me say something about his condition. Three things are said about his condition in verse number 20. First, he was indigent. He was a beggar, poverty stricken. Beggars were prominent. Beggars were numerous in and around Jerusalem in the first century. But do you notice here, our Lord mentions a certain beggar, again a certain one, destitute of daily needs, reduced to publicly begging for alms. But you'll notice something else interesting here. This beggar's proper name is revealed to us. Do you see it? There was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Now the name Lazarus means whom God helps and is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Eleazar. It's noteworthy again that parables do not contain proper names. We see a beggar, he was indigent. But secondly, he was incapacitated. Look at it here which was laid at his, that is the rich man's, gate. Now the passive voice of that verb, he was laid, simply indicates that Lazarus, the beggar, was probably unable to walk. The use of this verb, was laid, the word means it signifies to carelessly throw an object with no concern where it lands or the condition that results. Apparently, this was a crude attempt by some in the community to render what they considered to be a social stigma. Lazarus was harshly thrown down at the rich man's gate. And incidentally, do you notice the reference to the rich man's gate? That word gate speaks of a movable barrier just outside an oriental palace or a mansion. And it serves as a mute testimony again to the enormity of the rich man's wealth. Lazarus was indigent. He was a beggar. Lazarus was incapacitated. He was thrown that could even walk. Thrown down at the rich man's gate. But thirdly, Lazarus was infected. Look at it. The Bible says he was full of sores. Do you see the word sores there in your King James Bible? It's an interesting word. It's from a word in the original language that denotes open ulcerated, running lesions of the skin, unattended to, not cared for, prime targets for disease 
and infection. And you'll notice he was full of these sores. I mean, they body. Somebody has suggested you could not take your index finger and touch him anywhere on his body, but what you wouldn't find, one of these open, running sores or lesions. We see the beggar's condition. But look at something else here. This fascinates me. Notice his concentration. Look please at verse 21a. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Now, there's no indication in this text that Lazarus coveted any of the rich man's material possessions. But Lazarus did want one thing. He desired, he wanted the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Now, cultural historians have noted that napkins were not used at the banqueting tables of the extremely wealthy in the Orient in that first century. The host and his guests actually wiped their hands on pieces of fresh baked bread, then threw the pieces known as the crumbs down around the base of the table to be cleaned up by the servants after the banqueting was over. It was these crumbs that Lazarus apparently wanted but never received. We see his concentration. But look at something else here. He was not alone. Look at his companions. Look at your Bible. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sword. Do you notice the word dogs here? The word will not allow for domesticated animals. These were not lap dogs. These were apparently wild dogs. Dogs that ran in packs, extremely vicious, aggressive, and very dangerous. And the imperfect tense of the verb here would suggest they just kept on licking Lazarus' sores. Apparently Lazarus was so weak he couldn't even fend off these mangy mongrels. So we see two men before the grave, their earthly existence. But wait a minute. Let me close tonight. Let me finish tonight by looking at verses 22 through 26 with you. I want to look at those same two men for just a few minutes beyond the grave their earthly existence. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to witness one of the greatest exchanges recorded in the Bible as a loathsome leper becomes a rich man. And a rich man becomes a loathsome leper. Follow along with me please in verses 22 through 26. Notice in verse 22a, notice the beggar beyond the grave. Now look at verse 22a. You'll notice here the Bible says the beggar died. Physical death literally overtook Lazarus. No doubt a relief to some in the community, but an even greater relief I submit to you, to Lazarus himself. Do you notice the obituary here? Very simple in Scripture. The beggar died. It's noteworthy that there's no mention of the burial of Lazarus' body. Now basically, beloved, we're left with one of two possibilities. Either the sore-ridden body of Lazarus was carelessly thrown on the garbage heap in the valley of Hinnom just south of Jerusalem where a fire burned day and night consuming the garbage and the refuse and even the bodies of criminals executed for their crimes against the state of Rome. Or the sore-ridden body of Lazarus was devoured by those dogs that were licking his sores. Be that as it may... I'm glad that the emphasis is not on what happened to him on earth. Amen. The emphasis is on what happened to him beyond his earthly experience. Amen. Listen to me tonight, dear friend. You may be here tonight. I trust every one of us are saved. But if you're under the sound of my voice tonight and you're lost, perhaps you've mistaken like I did your church membership for the new birth, being baptized in water for being washed in the blood. If you're here lost tonight, sinner friend, let me say to you, it's one thing what happens to you before you die, but it's something else what happens to you after you die. And notice here, please, notice the death of this beggar Lazarus here. And now notice what happened beyond the grave. Notice Lazarus, we're told, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now before the grave, Lazarus was carelessly, thoughtlessly thrown down at the rich man's gate. But after the grave, thank God, he was carefully and compassionately carried into eternity by the angels of God. What a move 
from total poverty to total paradise via an angelic escort. Now look at your Bible here. Look what he says here very plainly. Notice, we see that beggar beyond the grave. And let me say just a word if I may before I move on about our Lord's reference to Abraham's bosom. Do you see it there? Let me say just a word about that tonight. Prior to our Lord's resurrection and ascension back to the right hand of the Father, the heart of this earth planet was divided into two compartments. There was the fireside compartment, a place of woe and torment and damnation called in the Bible in the Old Testament the Hebrew word Sheol and in the New Testament by the Greek word Hades. Both words referring to the permanent abode, the lost abode, if you please, of the unsaved dead. But there was a second compartment in the heart of the earth according to this record that we're studying tonight. There was a, a region, there was a compartment known as paradise. Now the word paradise is a Persian word. It's found in the Persian dialect. And it literally, ladies and gentlemen, means a large, lush, green garden. Paradise was the compartment where all the Old Testament saints and all those who believed on Jesus Christ up to His resurrection went after physical death. Abraham was there. And Abraham's bosom came to signify the resting place of the saints after death. If you turn over tonight, I'm not going to ask you to do it, but perhaps you'd jot this down as a reference for you tonight. If you'll turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, you'll discover that Paul refers to the Lord Jesus after He died, ascending into the heart of the earth, into the paradise compartment of the heart of this earth. And there he proclaimed to the Old Testament saints his redemptive victory on the cross of Calvary. And then the Bible says, tells, I believe teaches very plainly there in Ephesians 4, he led captivity captive. He emptied the paradise compartment of the heart of this earth out and led those saints in triumphal procession right through the devil's backyard, through the air, up, 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 into the third heaven where the throne of God is. And tonight, heaven holds paradise and that's where we're going if we're saved by the grace of God. Just wondering tonight, anybody want to go along? Not one thing I've done, not a prayer I've prayed, not a sermon I've preached, not a good deed I've done, but my hope is firmly fixed in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Woo! I like it. Saved by the grace of God. Lazarus was carried into paradise by the angels of God. The beggar beyond the grave. But wait a moment. Would you move on with me quickly here tonight and I'll try to close tonight. Look at verse 22b through 26. Here we have the other man. We have the rich man beyond the grave. Look please at verse number 22b and notice the interment of the rich man's body. Look at it. The rich man also died and was buried. Do you notice that little word also? Material, all the material wealth that the rich man amassed on earth while he was alive could not stay the ice cold hand of physical death, the great equalizer, for even one moment. Someone said that one of the queens of England on her deathbed before she died uttered these words, the half of my kingdom for 30 more minutes of life. And ladies and gentlemen, as wealthy and, and, and all the material things that she had, she could not stay the icy cold hand of death. I want to tell you something tonight. I trust and pray you don't think me morbid. Preacher, I trust and pray I won't be considered talking like that tonight. But if the lovely Lord Jesus does not return in the rapture phase of His second coming, there's going to be a tombstone chiseled out for me. There's going to be a casket made for me. Now don't you think I'm morbid, but I, th I feel like I'm in touch with eternity. We were coming back from somewhere the other day, and I thought I was moving along pretty good. In a, in, in a passing lane, a big truck came by us, and lo and behold, it was a casket company. And there was that casket company. And you know what thought went through my mind? I wonder if mine's on board that truck.
Oh, preacher, you're being morbid. Really? No, I don't think so. Could it be tonight? Could it be that they've already chiseled the marble that will bear my name in death? Could it be that they've already made the casket that will hold the earthly remains of my body after physical death? Could it be? I'm glad to tell you tonight that before my body's cold, before my eyelids stop blinking, before my toes stop wiggling, before my blood coagulates in my veins, I'm glad to tell you, absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's meaning something to me in these days. I don't know if you've noticed lately, but we're living in a crazy world. I don't get off track here, but we're, getting in, we're living in a crazy world. And wouldn't it be sad if this was all there was to it? Now hold on a minute. I love living. You've never looked a preacher between two red eyeballs that love re living more than I do. But hear me tonight. The more what I'm seeing going on out there, the more wonderful heaven is sounding to me. The choir reminds us a few more, I'm homesick for my Lord. Never even been to heaven. Not yet. But by the grace of God, I'm going. The rich man couldn't stay the icy cold hand of death. But notice an interesting detail here. We're told, unlike Lazarus the beggar, the rich man was buried. Doubtless it was an elaborate funeral. No doubt the local Jewish synagogue, and I'll say more about that in a moment, was no doubt packed with family, friends, and dignitaries. Surely the air was filled with the, with the noisome cries and the, the, the terrible cries, the unearthly cries of the professional mourners who had been hired to mourn the rich man's passing. Don't you know that there were certainly an abundance of flowery eulogies of, that offered praise of the rich man and his greatness in life? What a sharp contrast with the beggar Lazarus. But wait a moment. The interment of his body in verse 22b. Look what's really going on with the rich man in verses 23 through 26. Look at the incarceration of the rich man's soul. Look at your Bible. Look at the rich man's dreadful discovery in verse number 23. He discovered three things. Let me give them to you very quickly. First, he discovered he was condemned. Look at your Bible. And in hell he lift up his eyes. Now let me say tonight, and I am no Greek scholar, but I want to be, there is no interval of time between the end of verse 22 and the beginning of verse 23. The Greek text will not allow it. The rich man died in verse 22 and he's in hell in verse 23. Think of that. He dies in verse 22 and he's immediately in hell. No soul sleep. No reincarnation. No suspended animation. He died in verse 22 and he's in hell in verse number 23. And notice there in hell, look at your Bible. Look at how he lift up his eyes. The participle form of that verb simply suggests he has kept on looking up as though surveying the horizon, as though looking for some familiar face that perhaps had come to rescue him from his dire circumstances that which individual never did or never was realized. He was condemned. But something else, notice, he was conscious. Look at it quickly. Being in torments. Hear me tonight, friend. Man is not unconscious or asleep. He could feel pain. And he can feel pain tonight. I'm saying to you that he is very conscious of his surroundings and his indescribable agony ultimately discovered he was conscious. But wait a moment, there's something else. This fascinated me. He not only discovered he was condemned, he discovered he was conscious, he had the five senses of the human body available, but he also discovered he was confined. Look at your Bible. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. He was confined, but he had some perception of distance. Do you notice our Lord's reference here to afar off? You see, the rich man could see paradise. He could see Abraham. He could see Lazarus. And yet he was separated from it. How far was hell from paradise? We're not told. While I was pastoring in South Carolina, Pastor, I have the privilege of meeting Dr. David Sustar, a great preacher in his own right. He tells the story of how several years ago a tremendous evangelistic meeting broke out in a little rural community in a little church there 
One night after preaching on hell, the evangelist felt strangely impressed to go back and speak to three young men on the back row. He was about to ask them if they'd like to be saved when one of the young men mockingly said, Hey preacher, how far is it to hell? The other two laughed and the three exited the building. The story goes that the evangelist's heart was broken as he heard their car engine crank up. He heard the tires squeal as they pulled out of the church parking lot and drove off into the night. Later that night, before the benediction was pronounced, a tall, strong state trooper with saddened face came to the back of the church and asked to speak to the preacher. He described three young men and the clothes that they were wearing. When he was told that they had been at the church but had left earlier that evening, he said that their automobile had left the road at a high rate of speed and literally wrapped in half around a huge oak tree just two and one half miles down the road from the church. All three young men died on impact. As the evangelist thought about the fact that these three young men surely must have died unsaved, he suddenly recalled the question that one of them asked, Hey preacher, how far is it to hell? For those three young men, hell was only two and one half miles down the road from that little church. Sinner friend, could I ask you a question tonight? How close are you to hell? Let me answer that. You are one ruptured blood vessel in your brain away from hell. You're one heartbeat in your chest away from hell. David said there's but a step between me and death. You know what you need to do? You better turn to Jesus Christ while you still have the opportunity. The hour's late. This thing's winding down. This dispensation of the grace of God's coming to a close. You better get in while you still can. And those of us who are in, dear Lord, doesn't he, isn't He worthy of our praise tonight? Amen. Amen. Save. I'm just, could I just, anybody here saved by the grace of God tonight? Yeah. Hey, hey, saved. <laughs> Brother V.J. Bolin in Central South Carolina said it well, saved and saved good. <laughs> These three young men died. The dreadful discovery that the rich man made. But would you look at something else quickly here with me tonight? Look at the rich man's desperate cry. It's threefold in verse 24. Look at it with me quickly. First of all, quickly, he cried for mercy. Look at it. Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Do you notice the rich man's nationality that I made reference to earlier tonight? Do you notice his nationality is clearly disclosed here? He addresses Abraham as Father Abraham. This was a religious man. He was Jewish. He died religious. Do you and I realize tonight there are religious people in hell tonight? It's possible to be religious and go to hell. Oh, I don't know of a sadder route to take to the pit than by the road of religion. And now the rich man, he is desiring Abraham to relieve his sufferings and give him deliverance. But do you notice, and I draw attention to this, do you notice the first thing he says? Look at the first cry. Have mercy on me. Oh, I know. I've heard it like you have. These misguided individuals, like some of these, some of these people of these putrid rock and roll bands who openly boast, we want to go to hell. We're going to meet up with our friends and party there. You hear me tonight, ladies and gentlemen. You hear me well tonight. There are no parties in hell. The first cry in hell is not for another beer. It's not for another needle in the arm. It's not for another night of frivolity or immorality. The first cry in hell is for mercy. Have mercy. Years ago, I heard a dear preacher make the statement. He said, other than the Lord Jesus Himself and perhaps the Apostle Paul, if I were permitted to bring one man to my pulpit and preach to my people on Sunday morning, it would be the rich man who died without Christ. Now you take that for what it's worth. But I'm going to tell you something tonight, friend. There's a real hell out there and real people are really dying, really going there. What will we be doing? What, are, what should we be doing down there at Midway? We better be getting the gospel out, friend. We better be preaching Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and risen again. The first cry in hell was for mercy. He begged for mercy. Look, secondly, he cried for ministry. Look at it here. The Bible says, 
and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Now, I want to show you something here that fascinated me about this text. Do you notice the two verb forms here? Have mercy and send Lazarus? Both those verb phrases are translated in the imperative mood. Now, you again, you English majors know that the imperative mood signifies a command is being given. Can you believe that? The rich man's in hell and he's commanding Abraham what Abraham ought to do. Why would he do that? Wait just a minute. The rich man all his life had been accustomed to ordering servants to meet his every need. He's now in hell. His condition is unbearable. And if nothing else, by simple mental reflex, he resorts to the only thing he ever knew, commanding somebody to meet his need. I say to you tonight, he's frustrated because his religion did not keep him out of hell. Ladies and gentlemen, I say this tonight, I'm judging nobody, so relax. But I'm persuaded tonight there are going to be people, and there are people in hell tonight, angry like the rich man because their religion didn't save them. Because their, their belief system didn't save them. Because walking down an aisle didn't save them. Shaking the preacher's hand didn't save them. Parroting a prayer back to the evangelist didn't save them. Nothing wrong with walking the aisle, shaking the preacher's hand or praying a prayer. As long as you get saved, nothing wrong with that. But you're not saved by walking an aisle, shaking a preacher's hand or praying a prayer. You're saved by placing your trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Saved. (laughs) Saved by the grace of Almighty God. They're angry people in hell. Angry because their religion would not save them. But look at something else here quickly, quickly in your Bible. Notice with me here. Notice the essence of the command. He says, Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Now, medical experts and those who study the anatomy of the human body tell us that the surface of the human tongue is literally covered with tiny sensors capable of detecting cold and heat. The essence of this command was for Lazarus to take his index finger, dip the tip of it in cool, clear water, and then place those cool, clear drops of water on the parched tongue of this rich man. What a command. Place those drops of water on my tongue. What do you suppose one of these little 12-ounce bottles of water would be worth in hell today? And I'm not being trite or trivial when I say that. What would it be worth? But something else here quickly. Notice he cried for in misery. Look at it. For I am tormented in these in these flame in this flame. Do you see that word tormented? It's from a Greek word that literally means to feel every bit of the pain that he is experiencing. I mean, he he had nothing to. He didn't have a Tylenol. He didn't have some type of a numb, uh, mind numbing, body numbing drug to take. He said, I'm tormented. I feel every bit of the agony that I'm in. In hell, there's no relief but a full exposure to the wrath of God for turning down the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son. Oh, but the liberal cries out, that bleeding-hearted liberal, oh, that's unfair that God would do something like that. You're telling me, sir, you're telling me, ma'am, that the God of heaven who virtually pulled His virgin-born Son away from His his chest, away from His bosom, sent Him into this sin-cursed world, let Him live here 33 years and ultimately be mocked and made fun of, nailed to the accursed cross of Calvary, and bear the sin of every man, woman, girl, and boy, and be baptized in the wrath of God. And you're telling me that God is not fair to send somebody who thumbs their nose at that crucified Christ. You hear me tonight, preacher, I'm going to be as nice as I know how. You reject the Son of God and you'll go to hell just as straight as a martin flies to its gourd. I don't like you, preacher. I might just be, I might just be one of the best friends that you've got. I'm telling you the truth tonight. There are people in hell tonight. They don't want to be there, but they're there. And they're tormented in this. And you know, something else here. We've lived to see the day when people have virtually, I'm not trying to be trite, they tried to air condition hell. Have you noticed that? William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said one of the chief things that will be a problem for the, for, the latter, for the modern church is preaching heaven without hell. You hear me tonight? If there's a beautiful heaven, there's a terrible hell. 
Let me say it this way. Let me rephrase that. Since there is a beautiful heaven, there is a terrible hell. And this rich man is there and he feels completely tormented. He's in unending, unrelenting misery. But oh, wait a minute, quickly, quickly. Would you look as we close night, verses 25 and 26. Give me just a second. I want to show you something here. Look at the rich man's destiny at seal. We've heard, or rather we've seen his dreadful discovery. We've heard his desperate cry. But would you look quickly with me at verse number 26 and 20, 25 and 26. Look at his destiny. It's sealed. Look at verse number 25. He's just asked Abraham to send Lazarus and cool his tongue. But pay particular attention to what Abraham says to him. Son, remember. The rich man's in hell. He's lost his soul but he's retained his relentless memory. Dr. Wilbur Penfield, former director of the Canadian Neurological Institute, made this statement, and I quote him, Your mind is like one continuous piece of movie film. As you relive the events of the past, you can see, hear, and feel the details of the events as they actually happened. Quote, unquote. Listen to me, sinner friend. The sinner who goes to hell will retain his or her relentless memory. Hear me tonight. Sinner friend, you in hell, you'll remember forever. That family member, that co-worker, that classmate, that personal friend that came up to you, put a hand of love and concern on your shoulder, and as the tears streamed down their cheek, begged you to come to Jesus Christ, and you said no. You'll remember it forever. In hell, you remember forever, sinner friend, that little gospel tract that somebody became impressed of the Lord to give to you and pled with you and, and was pleading with you, trust Christ as your Savior. A gospel tract you wadded up is unimportant, insignificant, and tossed it, tossed it carelessly into the trash can. You remember forever that little gospel tract. And if you are so unfortunate as to go to hell as a sinner, you'll remember forever the last verse of the invitation hymn such as the one penned by Philip P. Bliss, almost persuaded now to believe, almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way! Some more convenient day on thee I'll call. But like Governor Felix in the book of Acts, a more convenient season will never come around again. You hear me, sinner friend? Your heart tonight, unless you've crossed a deadline, your heart tonight will never be more tender than it is tonight. And I plead with you tonight, in the name of the Christ that loved you and gave Himself for you, come to Him and trust Him while you still can. The answer that the rich man was given, or I should say the, the destiny that was sealed, or the answer that he was given. But would you look at something very quickly. Look at verse number 26, and we're done. Abraham tells him, son, we can't get to you. There's a great gulf fixed between us and you. So that they that would come from us to you cannot, neither can they come from you to us. Did you notice Abraham's reference to a great gulf? That great gulf is fixed. It's stationary at that time. What do he mean by that? What is this gulf that he's talking about? If we were to turn, we won't take time tonight. But if you turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, and I think it's through verse number 10, you're going to find Peter mentioning a certain group of angels who fell with Lucifer in his coup attempt to take over the throne of God. How foolish to say the least. But these fallen angels of which Peter is speaking, he says they're already confined, already incarcerated in chains of darkness in hell. Now, I would expect it to be the Greek word Hades. That's not the word there. Now, hear me. Please listen to me. Please listen to me tonight. That word hell that Simon Peter uses is the word tartareo. It's from the root word tartarus that means the abyss, the bottomless pit. Apparently, there are some demons that are so, malign, uh, so malevolent, so evil and so wicked, God in His wisdom, grace, and mercy has chosen not to give them access to the human race. Thank you, Lord. And those angels are already confined, apparently, in a place even lower than the hell the rich man's in. It's the bottomless. I'm you believe whatever you please. But the gulf that was impassable that Abraham spoke of and Tartarus, that 
Simon Peter's, I believe they're one in the same place. Could I simply say it to you this way? That gulf had a twofold message for us tonight. First, the lost, or excuse me, the saved cannot be lost. And second, the lost cannot be saved. Well, preacher, I've been told I'll get a second chance after death. Who told you that? That has the hiss of the serpent. That's a lie of the devil. What you're going to do with your soul's salvation, what you're going to do with your salvation, what you're going to do with Jesus Christ, Dr. B.R. Lakin said it best, it has to take place before the wood of the cradle bumps the marble of the tomb. You're going to have to trust the Lord Jesus while you still can. So, son, remember, you had it good in life. Lazarus didn't. And now this gulf will not permit us to come rescue you or permit you to get over to where we are. I'm trying to tell you tonight, death seals an eternity. I want to close tonight with something I, I remember so vividly. When I had the privilege of being down at Luther Rice in seminary there just below Atlanta, I had the privilege of sitting under Dr. Stephen Olford, one of the great Bible expositors and teachers of years gone by. Dr. Olford is now with the Lord, but what a, what a champion of the Bible. He used a good King James Bible. I loved him. In a, one of the, I looked forward to his classes. I'd take anything I could get under him. But for many years, Dr. Stephen Olford was pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church in New York. A huge sign out in front of the church invited all that would to come and hear Dr. Olford preach the Word of God. Not far from Calvary Baptist Church was an infamous bar and tavern known as the Gates of Hell. Etched just above the wine glasses, the beer mugs, the liquor glasses, and the shot glasses were these words, quote, We will be open on Judgment Day. A group of tourists were visiting New York and they wanted to see this famous, notorious bar. And so they asked a local resident, Sir, where is the gates of hell? As the man pointed toward the huge church sign, this is what he said. Do you see that sign that says Calvary? The gates of hell is just beyond Calvary. For the man, the woman, the girl, the boy to go beyond Calvary where Jesus died to keep them out of hell is to find the gates of hell. And how the gates of hell finds you, sir, Ma'am, young lady, young man, as the gates of hell find you, so eternity will hold you. There is a biblical hell, and I will tell you, Jesus Christ left all of heaven's glory and came down here and poured out deliberately every drop of His redeeming blood to keep you out of that awful place. Are you willing to receive Him? Now, preacher, I, I think I'll just trust my religion. I'll be as kind as I know how. You're foolish. You'll wind up in hell just as sure as we're in this building tonight. Preacher, why are you preaching like this? Because I was there. I, had, I was going to hell with a church membership certificate in one hand and a baptismal certificate in the other. I didn't even know. Thank God for the Holy Ghost who came my way and revealed my lost condition and let me trust the Savior as my own. There's a literal burning hell, and we don't have time to see it tonight, but if you read on this word, hell sends word. Stay. Beyond this sphere of mortal time, there is a place where souls are bound. A realm of torment and of woe where those without the Savior go. Sinners there are without light. Their cries are echoed in that night. No daylight dawns to bring them hope. No friends are near to help them cope. Imprisoned are the unsaved dead with no place to rest their weary heads. Crying, begging, seeking rest. But beyond the joy in hell, their agony is real as the fruit of their unbelief they feel. If only they could turn back time and leave their sinful lives behind. But the day of grace is gone, is past. The door is barred, is locked, is fast. Rejecting Christ, their guilt to bear, they are forever lost in hell. I pray that no one under the sound of my voice opens his or her eyes in the regions of the damned. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Pastor, I don't know if you want our musicians to come and the song leader, whatever you, that's, that, he's going to come in just a moment. The pastor's coming and he's going to take charge of the service in just a moment. But with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, just before I have a brief prayer with you, 
Could I ask you this personal question tonight? Do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt if your heart should stop beating in your chest and we could not resuscitate you, do you know for certain, are you sure tonight that you'd go to heaven? Are you sure of that tonight? Preacher, I, I, just, I just don't have any assurance of that. We were in East Flat Rock several weeks ago. I give God the glory. Felt strangely impressed on the assurance of salvation. And that night a young teenage girl got the full assurance of her salvation. And oh, what a wonderful time it was. If you're not sure tonight, you need to swallow your pride and make sure before it's too... Hell's too terrible. Heaven's too wonderful to either to miss heaven and go to hell because of your pride. You're lost and you don't know the Lord Jesus. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I'm not coming to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I promise you. But you say, Preacher, I am lost. I'm not a Christian. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up, slip it right back down. I won't come to you. I will not embarrass you. Anywhere in the building tonight, very quickly. I'm lost tonight, Preacher. Would you pray for me? Now let me ask this question very quickly. You that are saved by the grace of God, I'm not asking you to judge anybody now, please, so relax. But perhaps tonight the Spirit of God has caused a name to cross your mind tonight or perhaps the face of someone. Perhaps it's a family member. As I said earlier, perhaps it's a co-worker, a classmate, or just a friend. Perhaps that face of that friend, his name, her name, has flashed into your mind tonight and they're lost and they'll tell you they're lost. Could you just one more time, this side of an unending eternity, would you be interested tonight in lifting that person up to the Lord in prayer and asking God to have mercy upon him or her and save them? Would you cry out to God for them right now? You may be one of the few, if not the only person, praying for them tonight to be saved. In just a moment, we're going to stand together. Our pastor's coming. He's going to close the service as he chooses tonight. And perhaps not, and I'm not fishing for a thing. Now, you just relax. I'm not fishing for one thing. But if there's somebody on your heart tonight that's lost and you'd like to come pray for them. Somebody prayed for you, didn't they? Somebody prayed for me, thank God. But you'd like to come tonight and just simply bow quietly. Nobody will bother you. Nobody will disturb you. You'd like to simply come and pray for them around this old-fashioned altar. You're welcome to come. And send a friend, I plead with you again, please, please, don't leave this church. Don't leave the church grounds without being saved by the grace of God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Our Father, would you be pleased to take the words we've shared tonight, your word, and speak to our hearts with it. Take this invitation now, Father, in these few fleeting moments as we close the service tonight, as the pastor comes and directs us tonight. Direct him, we pray. And speak to someone's heart, we humbly ask, and we'll thank you for all you do. For we ask these things in Jesus' strong and matchless name, giving you the praise. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. They're going to begin singing in just a moment, and the pastor's coming. Would you respond now while you still have the opportunity?